Hello guys, um, welcome to my video. So today I'm going to be taking you through the May June 2023 paper one two um, for physics and the paper is one hour 15 minutes long. So I'm going to be explaining uh, the concepts, certain concepts that you need to know and I won't just assume that you know it. I'm going to take you through every single step so that you understand. For example, saying power is equal to force times velocity. I'm going to explain why that is true and why that can be applied so that you understand. So I'd advise that you watch the whole video, even the, the parts that you've worked out so that you can really understand where some of these laws come from. And please comment, uh, share and subscribe and like my video so that it can uh, reach to other people. Okay, so let's begin. Um, these are some of the constants that you'll be expected to use. Um, but I would advise you know some of them, for example, the elementary charge, the speed of light uh, in free space. So these are the things that I would advise you really just know um, so that it can really help you in your exam. Okay, so let's begin. Um, question one, it states that um, a stone sinks in water. Okay, so we're given a stone that sinks in water and we've been asked to state a possible value for the density of the stone. What is density? Well, density is the mass per unit volume, okay? That is basically what density is. So density is the mass per unit volume, and water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. What it means is if you have, let's say, one cubic meter that is full of water, it's supposed to weigh a weight of about uh, 1,000 times 10 newtons, or just a mass of 1,000 kilograms. Basically, that is what water is. And we know that a stone has to be heavier than water. So it can't be A because A times 10 to the power of 2 is actually smaller than 1,000 kilograms. So it can't be A. Um, if we look at C, these units are actually wrong. If we were to expand these units, this is actually kg, okay, m to s to the power of negative 2, m to the power of negative 1. This is actually kg, m, sorry, m to the power of negative 3. This is actually kg, m to the power of negative 2, s to the power of negative 2. And these are not the actual units for density, as the units for density are the kg m to the power of negative 3. So it can't be C, it can't be D, the answer is B. Moving on to question number 2, it says that uh, the gigameter, terameter, micrometer and picometer are all units of length, um, which unit is the largest and which unit is the smallest. As you can see on the right hand of your screen, I've put all the quantities that you'll be expected to know, or the prefixes that you'll be expected to know. And as you can see from the table, the terameter is the biggest one that has 10 to the power of 12, and the picometer has 10 to the power of negative 12. This is the smallest, and this is the biggest, as you can see from the right hand screen. So I'd advise you go through all of that. As I said, I just want you to understand the whole concept, right? So you usually know that what does a giga mean, uh, giga meter mean? What does a terameter mean? So that you can be able to answer questions. Move on to question number three. Um, we're given two measurements for a solid sphere. So we're given its mass and we're given its diameter. And we've been asked to calculate the percentage uncertainty in the density. So percentage uncertainty basically is how uncertain are you that your answer is correct. For example, you can get a percentage uncertainty of 20%, right? It tells me that I'm 20% uncertain that this is the density of my sphere. So the percentage uncertainty is basically what is your uncertainty? Maybe delta P over P multiplied by 100%. As you can see on the right-hand screen, I've put some of the scenarios where you will find different uncertainties. For example, if it's maybe y is equal to a to the power of n, the uncertainty of delta y over y is actually n times delta a over a. So it's very important for you to know that. So I've put that on the screen so that um, you can be able to see that. Um, so the question has asked me to find the percentage uncertainty in the density. What is density? Well, if we were to look at this, density... Okay, density is actually the mass per unit volume. Okay, so density is the mass per unit volume, right? So if you find the units of mass and, oh, sorry, if you express the uncertainty of mass and the uncertainty of volume, you'll be able to find the uncertainty in your density. But volume of a sphere is actually, so the volume of a sphere is actually 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Okay, so the volume of a sphere is actually 4 over 3 pi r cubed, right? But we know that radius is diameter over 2. So this is actually 4 over 3 pi d over 2 cubed. So this is the formula for you to find your volume, right? So I can re-express my density and actually say that my density, okay, 
my density is now equivalent to my mass divided by 4 over 3 pi d over 2 cubed. Right? So this is the formula for me to find my density. Right? But the uncertainty in density, so this is how we calculate it. So the delta in your density over your density itself times 100, the units for density is rho, as you can see here, times 100 is equivalent to. So you take the uncertainty in the mass. So I have a certain uncertainty in my mass, which I'll say delta m, divided by my mass itself, right? Plus, remember this is 3, like in my, in my example over here, of um, a to the power of n, um, d is also uh, d to the power of 3. So it will be 3 times delta d um, over d, right? So all of that multiplied by 100, okay? So basically, that should give you um, the, the uncertainty in this one, okay? So delta P over P, right? Delta rho, sorry, over rho uh, times 100 should be equals to, what is your uncertainty in mass? It's uh, 0 0.1 over 32 point that. So it's 0 0.1 um, over 32.5 plus um, 3 times 0 0.04 over 1, uh, 1 point, um, okay, so the diameter is 1.87, okay, 1.87, all of that multiplied by 100, that gives you an answer of 6.7%, okay? So basically, that is how you find the percentage uncertainty. What equation are you given? So delta m over that quantity plus, if there's a power, it's 3, if there was a half here, right, I would actually say half times if it was the square root of maybe mass over volume, for example, I would actually be saying delta m over m plus delta v over v multiplied by half, right? So whatever is raised to the power, you multiply by that power. Move on to question number four. We're given an aircraft that travels along a horizontal path. Um, two forces act on it horizontally. And we've been asked to represent the resultant force um, acting on the aircraft. So think of this, guys. If we have a force that's acting forward on our aeroplane, right, that is over here, this is the wind that is acting upwards. So these two forces will communicate and they'll create a resultant force in this direction, right? It can't be A. It can't be in this direction because it, it doesn't make sense. Now, this is actually the force due to the wind. So it's actually in the direction of that. It doesn't make sense. So the answer has to be C. It can't be B because it's actually pointing down, right? And this one force is, is one going up and one going to the right. It also can't be D. Um, moving on to question number five. We've been given a bow that moves from point X. So this is point X um, to point Y. This is point Y. And we've been asked to find the displacement of the bow from point X to point Y. So what is displacement? Displacement is actually the shortest distance between two points. Or more, if we put it more accurately, displacement is the distance moved in a specified direction. So what is important is the specified direction, right? Whenever we're talking of displacement. So if I were to tell you, move 10 meters to the right, right? That's my displacement. You're going to move 10 meters to the right. If I tell you 10 meters to the left, you're going to move to the left. So I need direction. It can't be A, it can't be C because they don't have direction. But it has to be the shortest point. So here, from X up until Y in this way is actually the distance, right? And from X up until Y in this point, this is actually the displacement, right? So this is the displacement and that is the distance. So I want to find this one. But this is the diameter itself, right? So this is your diameter. So this is the diameter of um, this particular circumference. So we know that the diameter is equal to the radius multiplied by 2. So if I have a radius of 1.0 by 2, that gives me a total of 2.0. But this is due south because from x to y is actually due south. So it becomes b, 2 meters due south. Moving on to question number six, we've been given a rock that is launched vertically upwards from the surface of the Earth and an identical rock that has been launched uh, from the surface of Mars. So as you can see here, we have this ball that has been launched on Earth and we also have this ball that has been launched on Mars. Okay, so very important. So this one has been launched upwards and that one has also been launched upwards. So we want to find the maximum height that it reaches. So remember, as a ball moves up, it reaches a certain height right, at the top here, where its velocity, so it's here, where the velocity will be equal to zero. The same on Mars, it's going to reach a point where its velocity will be equal to zero. So how do you find the maximum height from a graph? 
Well, the maximum height is actually the distance underneath a velocity time graph. We know that distance is actually the area underneath a velocity time graph. So we're going to find the area underneath this triangle, okay, as well as the area underneath this whole triangle. Right? And then we subtract the two. See which one is bigger? Obviously, on Mars, it has to be bigger. It's a bigger triangle. And then we subtract the two. Okay, So let's start um, with Earth. Right. So for Earth, we know that um, it's equals to half base times height. Right. So the base for Earth is actually 1.2. So if we were to look uh, closely, here we have 0. So this is 0 0.4. This is uh, 0 .0 0 0.2, 0 0.4. This is actually 1.2. And for Mars, let's just figure this out. This is actually 3.2, okay? So for Earth, it'll be half of the base, which is 1.2, and the height, which is 12, and this gives you a total of um, 7.2, right? So this is for Earth, and if we're to move uh, for Mars, right? So let's go for Mars. Um, it's again half the base for Mars times the height, right? Half the base for Mars is 3.2, the height is actually 12. This gives you a total of 19.2. Therefore, the difference in these two heights will actually uh, be your maximum height that has been reached. Okay? So the difference between these two heights, right? The question has asked me for the difference will be 19.2 subtract 7.2. That gives me a total of 12. So my answer um, is going to be A. Move on to question number seven. We've been asked which statement uh, describes the mass of an object, right? So the first, uh, so let's go through each answer. The first um, object is pinned due to gravity. This is actually weight, right? So A is weight, it can't be mass. Um, B is the momentum of an object. The momentum is not the mass. Um, D is the weight of an object as a measure by a balance. Essentially saying the weight, weight and mass are two different things. So the answer has to be C. But why C? Well, mass is actually a measure of what we call inertia. Okay? So mass is a measure of inertia. But what is inertia? Well, inertia is the resistance of an object. Okay? The resistance of an object to changes in motion. Right? To changes in motion. So let's assume you have a lorry. Right? That is like that. A very big lorry, right? And then you have a small car. This small lorry is going to be very difficult to start moving, right? And also be very difficult to stop moving, right? Because why? It has a higher mass, okay? A higher mass, and it also has a higher inertia. But this car, very easy to start moving, right? Also very easy to stop moving, or relatively easier than that lorry, right? Because it has a lower mass, right? Lower mass, meaning that its resistance to changes in motion is actually less. So I like to think of mass or in, um, as actually a measure of stubbornness. Because inertia is just how stubborn an object is. It doesn't want to stop moving. It doesn't want to start moving. Very stubborn because it has a higher mass. And if an object has a lower mass, it can easily start moving relatively to an object with a higher mass. So the reasons of an object to changes in motion becomes the mass itself. Move on to question number eight. Um, we've been given a submarine of total mass 3,200. And we've been told that that mass is suddenly decreased by 200 by pumping water out of the submarine horizontally in a negligible time, right? The upthrust that acts on this water is unchanged. So let us look at this water. Um, let us look at the submarine for a second here. The weight is acting downwards on the submarine, right? So let's agree on that. So the weight is actually acting downwards on the submarine. And the force that is acting upwards is actually the upthrust, right? So the upthrust is actually up, acting upwards and the weight is acting downwards. And these two initially are equal. It's in equilibrium because the weight is trying to push the object down, but the upthrust is saying, no, I want to go up. So the two forces fight and they reach a state of equilibrium where they are equal. So the weight, we can find the initial upthrust really because the initial upthrust, okay, is equivalent to the initial weight, right? So the weight will be 3,200 multiplied by 9.81. So this is the value of your upthrust. So 3,200 times 9.81 is acting upwards. And also the weight of 3,200 times 9.81 is actually acting downwards. And the two are in conflict. But if I decrease the mass by 200, meaning that the weight is going to change, 
right? So the up thrust is going to remain constant because the question is told me that the up thrust remain unchanged. So it remains at this particular value, but the weight is actually way, 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 way less, okay? So how do you find acceleration? Well, from Newton's second law, we know that force, okay, is equals to mass times acceleration. But this is actually the resultant force, okay? So the resultant force generally is, what are the two forces acting on your object? What is their resultant? So it's the up thrust, subtract the weight, is equivalent to the mass times A. But the mass is actually the new mass, which is 3,000, right? 3,000. Because it has deposited water of 200 kilograms, it's going to be left with only a mass of 3,000. So it'll be 3,200 times 9.81. The new weight is 3,000 times 9.81. The mass is actually 3,000 A. Okay, so basically A will be 3,200 times 9.81. Um, we remove 3,000 times 9.81 and we divide by 3,000. That gives you an acceleration of basically 0 0.654. Very important for you to remember that. So our answer is B. I'll move on to question number nine. We're given a block that slides with increasing speed from point P towards point Q. And we're told that the slope exerts a constant frictional force. But look at this. It's falling in air. What this means is that air resistance is not negligible. So air resistance is not negligible, right? We can't neglect air resistance because it's actually falling in air, right? So the total resistive forces, right? So these resistive forces, let's look at them for a sec. Um, these resistive forces are due to the friction, okay? Are now due to the friction plus the air resistance, right? So plus the air resistance. But we know that air resistance is related to the velocity of an object, right? It's related to the speed or to the velocity of an object. The higher the speed, the higher the air resistance. What do I mean by this? Well, imagine you're in a lorry that is open, right? An open lorry that is like that, right? You're in the back here, right? The faster this lorry moves, the greater you feel the wind pushing backwards on you, right? It's a, it's a fact. If you've been in a lorry before, if you haven't, well, if a lorry is moving forward, wind will be acting the opposite direction. So the faster the lorry moves, the more you feel in the wind. For example, even if you're riding a bike, the faster you ride your bicycle, right? The faster you'll be riding your bicycle, the more you actually feel the air resistance. So the magnitude of the total resistive forces actually increases why? Because this particular value um, of the velocity is actually increasing, right? Increasing speed, increasing air resistance. But it's important for you to understand, right? We've been resolving this, um, that this is your weight, mg. So this is mg um, sine of theta, right? So this weight is the one which is acting downwards, right? The component of weight here. But here we have uh, the frictional force, right? That is acting here as well as air resistance, right? So frictional force as well as air resistance. So the resultant force that causes the acceleration, right? Remember what I talked about acceleration? I said that F um, is equals to mass times acceleration. So the resultant force that is causing acceleration is due to mg sine theta, right? Subtract the value of friction, okay? Plus the value of air resistance, and that will be equal to my mass times my acceleration. But this air resistance is actually increasing, meaning that this whole thing actually increases. If that increases, this F has to decrease. If F decreases, the acceleration also decreases. So the answer um, is C. Uh, sorry, the answer is D. Moving on to question number 10, we've been given two balls um, X and Y that approach each other along the same straight line and they collide. The collision is actually perfectly elastic. What does perfectly elastic mean? It means that as objects collide, the kinetic energy is conserved, right? So if objects collide elastically, it means that the kinetic energy is conserved, right? So we talk of kinetic energy. Another fact that we mention is that the relative, okay? So before and after collision, the kinetic energy is the same. Another fact is what we call the relative speed of approach okay relative speed of approach right so let's put it over here so here's what we say right we say that the relative speed of approach um, 
the relative speed of approach is equivalent to the relative speed, so to the relative speed of separation, right? So these two are equal. Why? Because if two objects have constant kinetic energy, if they approach each other with a certain speed, that speed has to be the same when they move apart. And the trick for understanding relative speed of approach is that they have a relative speed relative to each other. What is their speed? And um, we find that particular value. So if two objects are moving in the same direction, right? So if it's in the same direction, so this is important for you to note. If objects are moving in the same direction, right? We um, subtract. We subtract their um, their relative relative speed, right? So if this is moving in that direction, right? So if this is moving in that direction, and that is also moving in that direction, right? Let's say it's moving with Vx, right? Which is bigger. So it's moving with Vx. This is moving with Vy. Vy is bigger. We just say Vy minus Vx, right? Simple as that. So if this is moving maybe at 6 meters per second, right? This is moving at 4 meters per second. It looks as if their relative speed is actually 2 meters per second. And if objects are moving in the opposite direction, what do you do? You add their relative velocities, right? Or their relative speeds, okay? So if an object is moving in that direction with speed Vx, another object is moving in that direction with speed Vy, it's Vx plus Vy. Add their two velocities. So here in A, um, object moves here, moves here. So this direction and this direction are actually opposite. And that direction and that direction are actually opposite. So very important for you to note. So this is actually ux plus ui. This is the relative uh, speed of approach, right? And here is actually vx plus vy. These two are equal. Relative speed of separation. And our answer um, is A. Very important. Moving on to question number 11. We've been given a road pivoted at point O. Um, we've been given a force F. That has been applied so this is point o and point o is actually my pivot right so point o is actually my pivot right and this is the force f that i'm applying at this point w and i've been asked to find the moment of a force what is the moment of a force well let us define that right so the moment of a force is actually the product of the perpendicular distance of a force right so the moment of a force is actually equivalent to the force itself, right? Multiplied by the perpendicular distance, okay? So it's the perpendicular distance um, from the line of action, from the line of action um, of a force to the pivot, okay? So this is basically what a moment is. In other words, a moment can also be thought of as the turning effect um, of a force. What do I mean by this? Well, remember when you're opening a door, right? So let's assume that this is your handle, right? You're about to open a door, right? It's more like that. So this might act as your pivot. As you open a door, you push a force down here, right? So you exert a force down here and your handle actually moves downwards and then you open the door, right? So you've at you've actually caused a moment about a certain point, right? You've caused a turning effect of your handle as you're opening your door, and that is actually what a moment actually is. So you need two things. The perpendicular distance, well, I'll just say, here is my line of action of force. Here is my perpendicular distance, 90 degrees. So I then find that moment. So if I go here, okay, I say, okay, if I were to extrapolate this force, it's acting in this direction, right? Which direction is perpendicular to this pivot, which forms 90 degrees? It's basically this one, okay? So the answer becomes um, B, right? Force times distance or Y. I'm moving to question number 12. We've been given a uniform road, XY, that has a weight of 10 uh, newtons, and we've been given it uh, being held by a force of F that is acting at an angle of 30 degrees, and we've been asked to find the value of F. So we can basically take moments about these points, right? So we can take the moments about this point, right? So we have what we call clockwise moments and we have what we call anti-clockwise moments. So the principle of moments says that the summation of the clockwise moments is equivalent to the summation of the anti-clockwise moments about a certain point. So about this point, this is actually the force that we're looking for. This is actually F 
sine of 30, this is 10 acting downwards. So the distance that we're looking for is actually this whole distance, right? But we're not given any distance, so I can just make an, a made up distance. I can just say it's 2 meters, for example, right? Meaning that this distance here will be 1 meter, right? So if this has 2 meters, that's 1 meter. I just made up that distance, right? But this is actually clockwise, right? So this is the clockwise direction, and this is actually the anti-clockwise direction, right? So the summation of the clockwise, which actually be 10, okay, multiplied by 1, that is equivalent to f sine of 30 multiplied by 2. So f will be 10 times 1 divided by sine of 30 multiplied by 2. So your force will be um, actually... Um, 10 newtons, right? So 10 newtons, your answer is C. Um, moving on to question number 13. We've been given two cubes, X and Y, that are made up of materials that actually have the same density. So we have two cubes. Let's do our cubes here, right? So we have cube X that is over here. And we also have cube Y that is over here, right? So cube X and cube Y. And it turns that cube A has twice the mass. So the mass of cube A is 2M. And that mass is m and the sides of here is x the size of there is y a cube has all the sides that are equal okay so how do we we've been told that the density is the same and be asked to find the ratio of x over y okay so let's think about this right um density is actually the mass per unit volume so let's compare for x right what is the density for x the mass of x is 2m volume is actually so volume of a cube is actually side times side times side so it's actually x cubed because we're saying here we have x times x times x so it's actually x cubed uh, that is our our distance that makes us uh, have our volume okay so considering y the density is actually m divided by y cubed and these two are equal so 2m of x cubed is actually equal to m over y cubed and one find the ratio of um, x over y. So x cubed m is actually equivalent to 2m y cubed. Okay, so y, um, so x cubed over y cubed is actually be 2m over m. Hence, x over y will be the cube root of 2, which is basically um, 1.26. And our answer is A. We want question number 14. We've been given a new glass uh, tube that contains liquid of density 2000 um, and wants to find the difference in pressures due to the level of uh, liquids between P and Q. So this is point P, okay? So, and that's point, point Q, sorry, and that's point P. So uh, there's something that you need to know about manometers um, and there's something that you need to know about pressure in a liquid. And I'm going to explain that shortly. But you just need to know that the difference in height here is actually 10 minus 6 was actually 4 centimeters. That's 4 times 10 to the power of negative 2. We're going to use that pretty soon. Okay, so there's something that I need to explain to you guys. We know that pressure, right? Pressure is actually the force per unit area. So if I give you a certain area and apply a certain force, right, on that area, it gives pressure on that area. Okay, that's basically what pressure is. But how do liquids behave? How do we find pressures in liquids, right? So if you have a certain liquid, or fluid rather, that has a certain weight um, that is etching downwards, we can find actually the pressure just by knowing the height h, just by knowing the density and g that we already know. How do we do that? We know that pressure is goes to force over area, but the force is actually mg because weight is mass times gravitational acceleration divided by the acceleration right but mass right from density like we've did in the previous question density goes to mass over volume so mass is equals to density times volume so pressure would therefore be um density times volume okay so our mass we can substitute that so pressure which will be density times volume divided by area okay but volume is actually equals to area times height right so if you have maybe something like that right if you find this area and you know this height you can find the volume okay so your pressure will be rho times a times your height h divided by a that makes times g sorry um that makes your pressure um 
B H rho G. So this is where it comes from, right? So if you know the height of um, a certain liquid that you have, you know its density, you know the G, the G, you know it, it's actually 9.81, you can then find the pressure. So if you're comparing level P and level Q, um, the value of our pressure will actually be, again, H rho G. So ask yourself, what is H? 4.0 times 10 to the power of negative 2. What is your value of G? 2,000. Um, what is your value? Sorry, the value of density is 2,000. The value of G, 9.81. That gives you a total of 784.8 pascals. Hence, that's 780 pascals, right? The answer is A. Very important for you to know how this formula works. This also is very important for you, uh, answering paper 2 questions. Move on to question number 15. Um, we've been given a steam turbine that turns a generator. Okay, The input power we're given and the output power we're given. Right? And been asked to find the efficiency of the turbine. So you need to know this. Efficiency, efficiency what is efficiency? Is the ratio of the power output divided by power input times 100, right? So basically, that is what efficiency is, right? It's also equal to the energy output over the energy input times 100. What does it mean? What if you put in and what you get out? For example, you might start reading, right? The amount of effort that you put into reading, that's your power input, right? The amount of results or the results that you actually get out, that's your power output. For example, if you read um, maybe a certain percentage of hours and you get a certain output, we can measure your efficiency. Basically, you put in this amount of effort and you go that out. So we might have maybe 60%, meaning you're 60% efficient. You're not getting out the desired outcome that you want, but you're putting in maybe a lot of effort, but your outcome is very few. So the answer is a D. Moving to question number 16, um, we've been given a constant force F that is applied to ensure a constant power is applied to a train, um, which graph best shows the variation of the force applied and uh, the dis and uh, the velocity, okay? So very important for you to know. Um, it, the, for the power is actually equals to force times velocity. But where does this come from? How do we know that power is force times velocity? Oh, let's go through that. Mr. Nine. We know that <coughs> we know that power is actually equals to the work done okay per unit time right so power is actually the work done per unit time but work done is force multiplied by distance right so force multiplied by distance divided by time is actually my power what work have i done over a certain period of time so my force multiplied by distance over time but distance over time you know this is actually velocity so power will be force multiplied by velocity so that is how we find power so now that we know that power is goes to force times velocity how do we interpret graphs whenever you see a question of graphs they are very high order questions you have to ask yourself what equation do i know what relationship do i know so we know that power is goes to fv but we're told that the power is constant remember variation it means that force is inversely proportional to the velocity right so we need an inverse proportional graph as you can see on the right hand of your screen, I've showed you a graph for direct proportion, a graph for inverse proportion. So direct proportion generally means as one quantity increases, the other quantity decreases. As one quantity increases, the other quantity increases. So this is for direct, right? And this is for indirect variation. This is for inverse proportion. So the answer is A. Moving on to question number 17, we've been given a block that slides from rest um, and slides a distance x down a straight uh, slope. So we've been asked to find an expression for the final speed of the block, okay? So the weight of the block basically acts downwards, right? So this is mg, um, mg here. And the component of this weight acts in this direction, right? So this is basically mg sine of theta, basically acting downwards here. But we don't have any friction. We don't have any air resistance. But the potential is actually changing. The height is changing. As we move from x... X is a higher height and Y is a high height, meaning that we have our potential energy, right? Our gravitational potential energy that is actually decreasing. But energy is conserved. Where is the energy going? Well, the energy is going in increasing the speed, right? So work is done in increasing the speed. So we can then find an expression 
we know that work is actually equals to the force that has been moved times the distance, right? So work is converting kinetic energy. Work done will then be half mv squared, an expression for kinetic energy. Um, the force will be mg sine of theta multiplied by your distance x. The m cancel out. So v squared is actually equals to 2g sine of theta multiplied by x. And your value of v is the square root of 2gx sine of theta. Right? So your answer becomes B. Very important. I'm moving to question 18. We've been asked to uh, state what is meant by a spring constant. What do we know about a spring constant? Well, a spring constant is actually, um, we know that force is equals to kx, right? Force is directly proportional to extension, um, provided that the limit of proportionality is not exceeded. That is basically what we call Hooke's law, right? So we know that k would therefore be force over x, right? The force per unit extension, the answer is D. Moving on to question number 19. Given a child that holds a thin metal wire that is attached to a kite, and a gust of wind increases the tension from 100 to 150, and you've been asked to find the change in potential energy. So whenever you see the word potential energy, what should come to mind is area under graph, right? Area under the graph of a force extension. Right? So if we were to move here, what is the area from 100 to 50? What is the area here? Right? It's all of that. That is my area. That is actually a trapezium. If we were to look at it from a mathematical point, that is actually a trapezium. So how do you find that area? The area of a trapezium, as you can see on the right left hand screen, is actually half of A plus B multiplied by H. Right? So it's half. What is your value of A? It's 100. Um, this is your value of A here. Um, a here, B here, and H here, um, plus 150, um, right? So that's basically half of 250 multiplied by H, which is this difference here, which is actually 0 0.15. So it's 0 0.15, but it's in millimeters. So it's times 10 to the power of negative 3. So that gives you a total of um, 0 0.01875 joules. That's about 18.75 millijoules divided by 10 to the power of 3. That's about 19 millijoules. So answer is B. Okay. Uh, moving to question number 20. We've been given a microphone that detects a sound wave. Okay. And it's connected to a cathode ray oscilloscope. And we've been given, um, and we've been asked to find the property, right? So property of a sound wave that can be determined using only the horizontal distance. So get this, guys. Um, the horizontal distance here, right, moving to this direction, is actually the time base, right? And as we move upwards here, this is actually the Y gain, right? So two important different quantities. This time base can be used for me to find the period. So it's basically, it might be milliseconds per division. How many milliseconds does one division represent? The Y gain is actually volts per division, right? How much volts does one uh, square represent so that's basically um the time base and that's basically um what you need to know so from the time base you can only get period and period can only give you frequency right only because frequency is equals to one over t right frequency is the number of cycles produced um the number of complete wave cycles that a wave can produce so it's related to the period the time it takes to complete a certain wave cycle is related to the number of wave cycle a wave cycles that you actually produce. So the answer is B. We can only get frequency directly from period. We can't get amplitude because if you look at a wave, this is its amplitude, right? If it's a distance time graph, this is its amplitude and this is actually um, its period. So these two have no relationship whatsoever. The speed, we know that V is equal to F lambda. We basically need the wavelength for us to find the frequency. Um, it's becoming complicated. For D, again, it's wrong because we also need um, v and F for us to find lambda. So the answer is B. Okay. Moving to question number 21. Um, we've been given a longitudinal wave that travels from left to right. So it's actually here, right? So it's traveling from left to right, left to right, right? Um, and the graph shows the variation of displacement of the particles with distance along the wave at one instance in time. If we move to the right, it's positive. If we move to the left, it's negative. And we've been asked to find which labeled point represents a compression, 
Very important for you to know that. Okay, so if we were to look at our graph very carefully, um, let us consider this point here, right? So this particle is actually um, moving to, okay, so let us consider this point here. They say that if it's positive, it's moving to the right, right? So all of these particles are actually moving to the right, okay? But if you consider the particles that are moving in the negative direction, right? So here, they're actually moving to the left, right? Because this is actually displacement um, in the negative, right? And if we were to look at this direction, the particles are actually moving to the right, right? So in a way, here, this is a compression because we have something moving in that direction and something moving in that direction. So it's a compression. But here we have something moving in that direction and something moving in that direction. That is what we call a refraction. Okay? But this is basically a compression because the things are moving in opposite direction and they're squashing each other up. So they're moving towards each other. So the answer um, is B. Very important, guys. A moment question number 22, and we're given a source that emits sound of constant frequency f, and um, that wave is detected by a stationary wave I'll detector y. What could be a reason for this, that y is actually less than f? This is actually known as the Doppler effect, right? So very important, this is known as the Doppler effect, right? What does the Doppler effect say? A Doppler effect is basically the apparent change, right? So it's basically the apparent change. <coughs> In the observed frequency, so apparent change in the observed frequency, due to what, right? So it's due to relative motion, due to relative motion, okay? Due to relative motion um, between the source um, and the observer, right? So this is basically the Doppler effect, right? So all you need to know about the Doppler effect, okay? So ask yourself. If it's y is less than f, so as we move towards something, the frequency actually increases. So frequency actually increases. Why does it increase? Well, imagine you're sitting at this point, right? Um, you are the stationary observer who is sitting over here. And a car is moving towards you, right? So this is your car. It's moving towards you, right? The waves of the car are going to get swashed up as the car moves in front of you, Right? These waves actually get swashed up so that it reaches you because the distance is getting shorter, right? And the waves still have to reach you. So they keep on getting swashed up, swashed up as the car moves towards you. But you know that frequency is equal to V um, over lambda. So we know that frequency is inversely proportional to lambda. So if lambda is decreasing, it means that the frequency actually increases. So you hear the sound actually becoming higher. If a car moves towards you the we and it's re uh Sounding a bell, the bell actually or the horn actually becomes louder as it moves towards you. The frequency actually increases, but it's moving away from you. So let's assume that this is uh, the observer, okay? If the car is actually now moving away from the observer, there's so much space that is present that the wave starts to spread apart, right? Starts to spread apart. And if this lambda actually increases, it means that the frequency will decrease, right? And we know that F note is actually fs um, v over v plus or minus vs so if this uh, lambda is actually changing and the frequency here will actually be less if you're moving away from an observer and it should actually be more if you're moving towards an observer so the answer um, becomes um, c it's moving away from the observer that is why the frequency y is less than f very important move on to question number 23 we've been given a beam of visible light right? With what could be the frequency of uh, the light? So get this, guys. The volume is actually equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength, okay? So if we ask to find the frequency, the frequency will be the velocity v over lambda. But light, what is the speed of light? Well, if you go to the beginning of um, every, every question paper, really, you'll find this, which is the speed of light in free space. So if you don't remember the speed of light, you just go back to your first page, you'll find that speed of light there. So we can then find the frequency because we know the speed, we can then find the frequency, okay? So the frequency would then be the speed, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8. What is the wavelength of visible light? Well, as you look um, on the left-hand side of the screen, on the right-hand side, sorry, you find different frequencies and wavelengths that I've put for 
different lights. But I really advise that you find a way of memorizing it in a way that you can understand because there are a lot of ways of expressing this. But I'll just take 700 times 10 to the power of negative 9, right? So this answer, if you compute this, we get 4.28 roughly times 10 to the power of 14. This is actually 5 point times 10 to the power of 14. It's the closest one. So remember, what is important is this prefix, the power that is over here. Here's 11, 8, 5. The closest one is 14 because this is also 14. So with these things, estimates, what's important is the power that you give them because there are a lot of um, answers that you could actually give. Okay. Moving on to question 24. So this is a question about Malice's law. So I would highly encourage you guys that you watch my video on Malice's law that I've posted in my channel. Where I was explaining what Muller's law is, where does the law come from, and how is the law actually used. So I recommend, highly recommend that you go and watch out that video because it really um, help you understand the concept. I've also posted, as you can see on the screen, I've also posted some um, questions that I've answered again on Muller's law, so that you can get deeper understanding of the concept itself. But I'm basically just going to explain a little bit um, from this diagram so that you keep on understanding um, Muller's law. So Malice's law basically says that the intensity that you get out is related to the angle between the transmission axis of the polarizer. So let's think of this as a polarizer and an analyzer, right? So we have two things that we consider, the angle between a polarizer and the angle between an analyzer. So guys, the trick to understanding Malice's law is about understanding what is your angle. That's the only trick that you need to understand about Malice's law. And I'm going to show you how you can find that angle. So I've been asked to express the intensity of the beam after the second filter. So let's say this is I2, right? We've been asked to find, if this is I2, we've been asked to find I2 in terms of I0, okay? So we first need to pass it through this. We get I1. Then we find I1 in terms of I2. Very important. So this light is already coming vertically polarized. Polarization means I'm restricting the motion of my light to one plane only. I'm just allowing my light to travel in one plane. Light travels in many planes. So if you restrict it to travel in one plane, it becomes vertically polarized. So this is vertically polarized light, right? So the trick to Malice's law is finding the angle. So the first one, I1, so let's start with that. So I1 will be equals to I0, okay, cos squared of theta. Right? How do you punch cos squared of theta? This is just cos theta squared on a calculator. You just punch cos theta and you square that. Okay? So if it's vertically polarized, so the trick to Muller's law is understanding the transmission axis. Please, guys. Um, the first filter has this transmission axis like that, meaning it's this angle. So what you do to make it easier, you extrapolate that line over there. Then you ask yourself, okay, what is the angle of the vertically polarized light? What is the transmission axis of that light? It's vertical. Right? It's more like that. So you take that vertical here, and then you position it here. So basically, it would then be this particular value that would then be looking at. Right? So these are your two transmission axes. And what you're looking for is this angle theta. This is your angle theta. Ask yourself, what is my transmission light? What angle is it coming from? And what angle is it going to be when it passes through the second filter? And that will really help you understand Malice's law what is your value of theta? So light is now going to be traveling in that direction as it gets out, right? So your theta is 45. We go here. We then say I1, okay? It's equivalent to I0 cos of 45, okay, squared. Um, and then you get I1 cos of 45 is um, squared is actually one half. And then you get your value of I0 to be um, one half I0. So I1 here is actually equivalent to I0, right? Very important. But what happens when you go through the second filter? Again, you apply Malice's law. So you really need to understand uh, Malice's law and what the angle actually is. It would then be I1 cos squared of theta. So I2, I1 is already half of I0 theta. So what we need is the value of the angle. What is the value of the angle? So guys, again, ask yourself, what is the transmission direction that I have? Right? So my angle is coming like that, meaning that my transmission axis is in this direction only. It's in that direction, right? Very important. It's in this direction only, that direction and that direction. So you take that axis and you put it over here. So it's more like that is your transmission axis, but your transmission axis now has been rotated in this way. Look at this arrow. It has been rotated in that way, meaning it's now horizontal, 
okay so if light is coming in that angle and it's now forced to be horizontal this again this is your value of theta right know the value of theta you're not comparing it to the vertical polarized light here we're comparing it to this we've rotated 45 degrees so we're finding that value of theta here we're also rotating it and we're also finding that value of theta so your value of i2 would then be equals to half of i naught cos um, of 45 okay of that squared that is also another half so half of i naught times half that gives you one quarter of i naught the answer is b so it's important for you to understand Malice's law. Understand what is your value of the angle and how does all of that relate and you'll be able to find the expression um, that you need. Okay, moving on to question um, number... Move on to question number 25. We've been given a stationary wave that is formed by two progressive waves that travel in opposite direction. So we have a wave that is uh, traveling in that direction, right? And it meets another different wave that is traveling in that direction. And the two then form a stationary wave, right? So it's very important for you to understand how they have been forming a stationary wave. So in a stationary wave, this is what you call a node. And this is what we call an anti-node, right? So a node... An antinode. An antinode is an area of minimum maximum displacement or maximum amplitude, and node is an area of minimum amplitude. So for us to form stationary waves, get this, we need light that are traveling at the same speed, right? So they need to be traveling at the same speed, they need to be of the same type, so they need to have the same frequency, and they need to have the same wavelength for them to meet. Because V is goes to F lambda. So if they have the same speed, the same frequency, the same lambda, the two waves can then overlap and they can add up and then they can form a stationary wave. At certain points, the amplitude is zero. At certain points, the amplitude is at its maximum. So we need the same frequency, same speed, and same wavelength. But we don't really need a constant phase difference. Why? Because this is the condition only for interference, right? So we only worry about a constant phase difference when you're talking of interference. But interference is very different from formation of a stationary wave. So you need to understand that the conditions that we need for interference are different from the conditions that we need to form a stationary wave. So the answer becomes um, A. This is not correct. Okay. Um, move on to question number 26. We've been given sound from a loudspeaker that causes a resonance of the air inside a tube. And a stationary wave with two nodes, right? So remember, like I said in the previous question, this is my node, that is my node, my anti-node, and that is my anti-node, right? So what do I need you to know about uh, this? Well, the distance between a node and another node is actually half of lambda. The distance between the anti-node and another anti-node is actually, again, half of lambda. The distance between a node and an anti-node is actually one quarter of lambda. Okay, so you ask yourself, how many nodes do I have? And you figure out that distance, right? So that is actually going to be equal to a certain value. What do I mean by this? Well, look at this wave that is being formed here, right? It has one node, two nodes rather, and two antinodes, right? We could have formed basically another different wave here, right? If we were to form a different wave that is more of these, right? So it's this wave is going to have maybe one, two, three, three four antinodes, four nodes, and a one, two, three, four antinodes, right? We're going to compress the wave too much that we're going to fit so many wavelengths within a space that is very small, meaning that the wavelength has to be smaller. But here, this length is equivalent to this certain lambda that is here. So the arrangement is more like this. It's a node, an antinode, a node, and an antinode. Remember I said a node to a node, that's half lambda. Antino a node to an antinode, that's one quarter lambda. So the total of that gives you three quarter of lambda. And three quarter of lambda is equivalent to 60 centimeters. So what is the value of lambda? That's four times 60 divided by three. That basically gives you um, 80. Which is 240 divided by three. That gives you 800 centimeters. That is basically 0 0.8 meters, right? So this is the value of lambda. But we know that V is goes to F lambda. Right? So your value of F will be 340 divided by 0 0.8. That gives you a frequency of approximately um, 430 hertz. Very important. So the answer is A. 
Question 27. We've been given a, uh, a continuous progressive wave that passes through a gap in a barrier. As you see here, right, as you can see here clearly, I've showed you um, the, the progressive wave as it is traveling, and I've showed you how diffraction is occurring, right? And we'll be told that the width is actually greater than the wavelength. Remember what I've said um, in the last video? I'd recommend you go back and watch... Um, the last video for May June 2023, QP11, or if you remember it, I talked about how the wavelength should be equal to, um, I talked about how if the wavelength is equivalent to the width, there's the greatest diffraction that occurs. But if the width is actually greater than the wavelength itself, it means that very little diffraction will occur. So if you want it to spread over a large angle, if you want us to have the greatest amount of diffraction, so if you want this diffraction angle to actually increase, we actually have to think about um, the value of the wavelength itself, right? Is it comparable to the, to the width? So what we can do is we can decrease the width here. Because it's already big, we can decrease the width so that it matches um, the wavelength and we have the greatest amount of diffraction. Very important. Moving to question 28. Question 28 gives us a double slit experiment that is happening, okay? So we've been given intensity i at point t, a point on the screen where the center forms, right? So a center, a center fringe is actually a bright fringe. Bright fringe meaning that we have the highest amplitude that we can find. Why? Because constructive interference has actually occurred at that particular point. Constructive interference generally refers to how two waves aid up and they become at a certain maximum point. It's constructive. They build each other up. Destructive means the wave destroys each other up. They meet in antiphase. One wave destroys the other wave and it becomes zero. The amplitude is zero or we have minimum amplitude, right? If the amplitude was the same. So this wave is coming from this angle and that wave is also coming from that angle, right? This is an amplitude A. This is an amplitude A. But we know that intensity is equivalent to K a squared, right? But the A here is 2, so your intensity is equivalent to K 4 A squared, right? So it's basically 2 squared, which is 4, it's 4 A squared, right? So the intensity before is actually 4 A squared, before we cover anything at all. But now, we have covered one of the slits, so let us cover the slits, okay? So let us cover this slit, right? So that it's no longer um, possible to emit light from that slit itself. Meaning that if we were to look at our diagram, the beam is going to change. This beam is no longer going to be there, right? Because we have closed the slit off. So we only know, we no longer have A2, we now only have A only, right? So this is going to affect the amplitude. So A is just going to come on its own, right? It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and it just hits the bright fringe with just an amplitude of A. Nothing adds up, nothing subtracts each other. So now, our new I2, right? The I2 that we'll be experiencing will be ka squared only. And we want to find i2 in terms of i1. So let's go. Uh, so we can divide these two equations. We know that i is equals to k 4a squared. We can divide the two equations. So this is basically how you work. Equations with intensity and amplitude, right? So you say i2 divided by your value of ka squared, right? So you close multiply the sides. So your i2 multiplied by k 4a squared will be equals to ka squared i. Right, so this cancel each other out, k and k. So your value of i2 in terms of i will be i over 4. And the answer um, is d. And the answer is d. Moving to question 29, we've been given green light of wave 550, which is incident on a diffraction grating. Remember, guys, whenever you see the word diffraction grating, one equation and one equation only must come to mind. d sine theta is equivalent to n lambda. Right? So we want to find, what do we want to find? We've been given the third order um, maximum on the screen, and we want to find the distance between two adjacent slits in the diffraction grating. So basically, we want to find the value of D. That is what D actually is. The distance between two adjacent slits is actually the value of D. But how do you find D? Very important. So we know that D is equivalent to um, n lambda divided by sine of theta. Right? So what is the value of n? Our n is 3, as you can see from the question here. We've been given a third order maximum. What is our value of lambda? Well, the value of lambda, if you go back here, it's 550. So the value of n um, is 3, and the value of lambda 
is 550 times 10 to the power of negative 9. We divide that by sine of. We don't know the angle, guys. What is the angle? The angle is the angle between the maximum that you're producing and this particular zeroth order, right? So this is your value of theta. But how do you find theta? We apply um, the laws for trigonometry. We know that tan theta, right? Tan theta is goes to opposite, which is 0 0.75 divided by 3.5, right? So theta, so theta actually um, is equivalent to arctan of 0 0.75 Right, divided by 3.5. That gives you something about 12, right? 12.094, 12 something like that. So if we put that here, um, we get a value of D that is equivalent to 7.84. Um, so this is basically our value of D. And yeah, so we get basically that, right? So to be our value of D, and our answer is um, C. Um, we're almost done. We're almost done. We're moving on to the last 10 questions. Um, we're given which charge can be carried by a charge carrier. So it's important to know that charge is quantized, right? What do I mean by quantized? It only exists as discrete particles, okay? Each electron has an elementary charge. <coughs> Each charge carrier is an elementary charge of 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. Right? Each elementary charge has that charge. So it means that if I'm looking at a particular charge that I have, it's supposed to have a multiple of this. You can't have a half electron that carries half of the elementary charge. So if you don't remember the elementary charge, again, I would recommend that you go back um, here. So you'd find that this is your elementary charge. Um, and you can use that value if you don't remember, you don't, if you don't recall it very well. Um, you can look at it um, back in the... Uh, formula booklet right that you'll be given so it has to be a multiple of um of this charge itself right look at 1.1 is not 4.0 is not 9.1 uh, is not so 4.8 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 19 if you divide by 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 we actually get what guys we actually get a value of three so we have three charge carriers that are actually existing in that if you try to divide 1.1 times 10 to the power of negative 19, and actually divide by 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19, you actually get a fraction. Obviously, the answer cannot be a fraction. So the answer becomes C. Very important. I'll move on to question 31. We've been given a resistor that is connected to a cell of EMF E, and we've been asked to find the greatest, uh, largest increase in the power dissipated in the resistor. So guys, what is power? In terms of resistors itself, okay, what is power, right? We know that power, like I have said, is work done, okay, per unit time. So the work that is done per unit time is basically power, okay? But work done, what, what work do we do whenever we talk of electricity? We know that voltage is actually the work done per unit charge. So if you have your cell here, right, like that, Remember that voltage, or EMF, is the work done. So if I have an electron here, it's going to get energy from the battery. It's going to start moving. So that work done per unit charge is actually voltage, right? So the work done is voltage multiplied by the charge. So power will be voltage times charge divided by time, right? But charge is actually AI current times time. So VIT over T. So this cancel out. So your power becomes your voltage times your current. Right, so power becomes voltage times current. So if you look at our question here, I'm given resistance. So very easy. So if you have power, um, that is voltage times current, right? So I've been given power is goes to voltage times current, right? So I know that V is goes to I R. So the voltage is equals to the current times the resistance. Where does this come from? It comes from Ohm's law. Right, or Ohm's law, we said that the voltage is directly proportional to the current. Okay, so um, we've been asked to find the change that produces the largest power. So power will be equals to V squared over R. And in our instance, the power will be E squared divided by R. Okay, so we're looking at what gives the largest increase in the power that we dissipate in the resistor. Think about this. If we double the value of E, so if we double, so E is directly proportional to power. If we double the value of E, we get 4P, four times the value of the power, 
right? If we double the value of R, so P is inverse proportional to 1 over R. If we double the value of R, we usually get half of P. If we half the value of E, we usually get one quarter of P. If we half the value of R, we usually get 2P. So the answer is A. That is where we have the highest change or highest increase um, in power. Move on to question number 32. So I'm given an electrical cable that is made up of one thick um, strand of copper wire that is surrounded by eight thin strands of copper wire. And all the wires are connected in parallel with each other. And each uh, thin strand of wire is a cross-sectional area A. And um, we've been given the cable that is total resistance of R. The question asks us to find the resistivity of copper. What is resistivity? Resistivity is basically the property that each material has. It's actually, um, so we know that resistance is actually equal to resistivity times L over A. It's the constant for the relationship between the resistance, length, and the area. So if these things are in parallel, what does that mean? It means that they're connected like this, right? So we have one something like that, something like that, something like that, and there are about nine of them, right? They're all connected in parallel. A parallel connection actually is one over the total resistance actually is the sum of the reciprocals of all of the resistances. Okay? Up until 1 over R9, right? It's the sum of all those resistances. That is basically the formula that we use. But remember, I said that resistance is equal to the resistivity times length times area. Because resistance is directly proportional to the length. The longer something is, the greater the resistance, right? The more this cross sectional area something has, the also, also the greater the resistance. So resistance and, and area are related. Resistance and length are also related. Okay? So we can then say 1 over RT. But the small things, right? So these small wires have a cross sectional area. So they have a cross sectional area um, of A. And this big wire has a cross sectional area of 4A, right? So it will be 1 over, so your R will be rho times L over A for these small ones times 8 of them, right? Plus 1 over rho L over 4A, okay? So basically 1 over RT will be equivalent to 8 over rho L over A plus 1 over rho um, L over 4A, okay? So if we were to express this um, as a normal fraction, right, so that um, this goes to the top here, so it becomes um, 8A, right, over rho L plus 4A over rho L. We're basically flipping the fraction. And if we add these two up, we get 12A over rho L is actually 1 over R. But we want to find the resistivity. So we want to find this particular value. So we cross multiply um, and we end up with our resistance. So 12A R is actually equivalent to rho L. So our value of rho is actually 12 times A times R divided by your value of L. So resistivity is 12 A R divided by L, which is D. Very important. I'm moving on to question 33. We've been, we've been given a car that has sensors for detecting light. Ooh. So this car can detect, okay, is this very light or is this a dim environment, right? It can also detect the temperature. Very fancy car. So it can detect light intensity and it can detect the temperature. Right. So it makes use of a light dependent resistor R. So that's what they use to find the intensity. And it also uses a thermistor. So a thermistor basically measures the change in the temperature of the environment. Right. So the car is moving from a warm to dark environment and it goes to a cold and bright environment. So imagine you have your car here. So let's look at it. So this is our car. Right. So it's moving in a warm environment. Right, that is very dark. Now it's moving now into uh, a cold and a very bright right environment. Okay, so how does this work? What is an LDR? What is the thermistor to begin with? Well, an LDR. Look at this graph, guys. So if we look at this graph, um, this is a graph that shows me the relationship between intensity um, and resistance. Right. So it's more like that. So if it's a bright environment, you have very low resistance, right? If it's a dark environment, you have very high resistance. That's how an LDR works. So it's basically something that says if it's dark, high resistance. If it's light, bright resistance. If it's bright, sorry, low resistance, right? And um, if you look at a thermistor, so this is an LDR. If you look at a thermistor, basically it has the same property. 
just operates on the principles of temperature. As the question um, actually says the thermistor, right? So if we look at that, so it's similar to that. So this is your resistance. This is your temperature. So this is cold and this is um, hot, right? So the hot height is the lower the resistance, the cold height is the higher the resistance. So very important for you to understand um, these working principles. So these two working principles are the ones that we use um, for that. Okay, so what then happens um, is that as we move from a dark environment, as we move from a dark environment to um, a bright environment, right? So we are in this environment, which is dark, and we're going to a bright environment. Okay, so it's from dark environment to bright environment. You can see that the resistance actually increases, right? So the resistance actually increases because we're going from a bright environment um, to a dark environment, right? And so very important. So from dark to bright, resistance increases. Um, so it increases. And as we go from um, a dark to a bright environment, okay? Sorry, the resistance actually decreases. Very sorry. Um, So as we go from a dark environment to a bright environment, the resistance actually decreases. The resistance of the LDR decreases, so decrease and decrease, so A and B wrong. And as we go from a warm to a cold environment, as you can see from my graph, I'm going from a warm to a cold environment, means that my resistance what? Increases. So the answer is um, B. So increase, decrease, right? So it's uh, C. Increases, sorry, C increases uh, and it decreases for that. Very important. Move on to question 34. We've given a student who assembles the circuit as shown, right? So the student has a circuit and we've been asked which row describes the state of the two lamps. So we've been given two lamps and we've been asked um, the state of this lamp. So this is basically what we call a diode that is forward biased, right? So this is a forward biased diode, right? So this diode is forward biased. And this diode is what we call reverse biased, right? So this diode is reverse biased, that diode is forward biased. What does it mean to say forward biased? It means that it allows current to flow through. Current reaches that point, the diode says you can pass through. The current enters in and it goes with its journey. So imagine electrons that are coming out, right? So if we have electrons that are coming out here, they're given a bunch of energy, okay? So these electrons, they've been given energy, EMF, energy that has been converted. So as they reach this point, they have a decision to make, right? They can move in that direction or they can move in that direction. So they will split up. They will say, okay, so we have two goals to accomplish. We have to go to lamp one and we have to go to lamp two. So they split up. Some say they will go in that direction. Others agree to go down. So some electrons will go here. Others will keep on moving in that direction. So they agree that they're going to move in two opposite directions. So if they reach here, the diode is actually forward biased. This arrow shows that it's supposed to move in that direction. So it allows the current to flow through. Here it is. So it reaches lamp um, one. So this electron deposits its energy into lamp one. It has no, no energy. So it reaches this point, right? These electrons that have went on the other journey, they said, okay, we prefer that one. We don't want to go that one. So they split up. So these electrons that are going this other direction will reach this point, right? Again, they, they have to devise. They have two routes that they want to go through. They can go through this route or they can go through that route. But here's the problem. In this route, it's reverse biased. Current reaches here. It's like a gate that's closed, right? Current wants to flow through, but the gates are closed. It's not going to force itself. I mean, the lamp wants to benefit. But if the diode is not allowing it to flow through, current will not flow. So it's going to reach this point, and the diode is going to say, no, you can't pass through. And current understands that. It's not going to force where it's not wanted because this diode has very high resistance. So it's not going to allow current to flow through. Okay, so electron says, let's go the other route. Right? So, right, we try to help you, but you can't allow us to pass through. So electrons go through this route. Right? So electrons enter through this. This is actually pointed downwards. So electrons come in here, right? It, this is actually more linear. The gate is open in that route. So electrons rather would take this route. They don't want to force things, right? So they move in that route. They reach this point. They go down. They reach this one, right? So they give all their energy to lamp two. Then they have no energy. They come, they come, and they meet here with the other electrons that had gone the other route. The two of them, or all of the electrons, sorry, they go back um, to the cell, okay? With no energy, um, they get here, they get a refill. They start their journey all over again. 
So the state of the two lamps is that they will both be on at the same time because electrons, energy is being deposited into these lamps. So they're going to be on, right? Because they have the same amount of energy. Electrons are splitting up. They have the same energy. They just split up. They give deposited energy into lamp one, also deposit that energy into lamp two. So the answer is D. Move on to question, uh, question 35. We're given Kirchhoff's uh, first law. With, and it's, we're asked it's a conservation of what quantity? It's basically charge. So kick, Kirchhoff's uh, first law talks of charge. And Kirchhoff's um, second law talks of uh, energy. Right. So this is basically Kirchhoff's second law. And the question is asked us for Kirchhoff's uh, first law. So first law has to be charge. And the answer is A. Right. Very important. So these are the two things that we only deal with. Um, in Kirchhoff's law. What does Kirchhoff's first law say? It says that the sum of currents entering a junction is equal to the sum of current leaving that junction. What does that mean? It means that if you have a certain junction here, like, like I've said, electrons are going to split up, current is going to split up, some is going to move up, some is going to move down, some is going to move in that direction, but they all have the same energy. When they reach a junction, they split up. But after they're done with their journey, they have to come back together and say, okay, we're done, let's go back and get a refill. So they all come back here. So the sum of currents entering through a junction is equal to the sum of currents leaving a junction. That's basically Kiko's first law. Moving on to um, question 36, we're almost done, four questions to go. Um, so we're given three identical cells that each have an EMF of E, and they have a negligible internal resistance. So we've been asked um, the potential difference across one of the resistors, right? So this is basically trying to uh, see if you understand how Kirchhoff's second law actually works. So basically Kirchhoff's second law says that the summation of EMF across a closed loop is equal to the summation of potential difference across that same loop, right? So we have one loop here. So what is a loop? A loop is basically the distance that has been moved. So basically this is our loop, right? So this is our loop here. So basically, this is our loop, and we want to find um, the summation of that versus the potential differences that are occurring at these different points. Right? There's points um, at that point and at that point, right? So let's start our journey. Our electron is given energy here, okay? So it's E. Um, it moves through here. It spins the potential drop, so it's IR, right? So it's PD here, so it's IR here, right? Has few energy. Okay, it comes to this point, right? The battery here is connected in opposite polarity to this one. So it's positive here, negative here. So it's also trying to send other things. It's also trying to push electrons in this other direction. So remember, these charge carriers are not in these batteries, right? They're in the wire itself. But this is trying to oppose the motion of these electrons. So it's going to force things to move in the opposite direction. So it's negative E. Then when it reaches here, it's going to be a potential drop here, potential drop here of IR. Here it's in the positive direction, so here it allows it, it gives us a boost, right, of plus E. So whenever it's always connected in positive um, polarity, it's going to cause it to lose energy, minus E, EMF is subtracted from that side. Whenever it reaches the point where it's connected in the right direction, it's going to allow it to move, so it's plus IR. Here we also have IR, so here we also plus IR, so we get 2, um, two E minus E is equals to 3 IR, so we get E is equals to 3V, uh, so V is equals to E over 3. So the answer is B. Moving to question 37, the last question on electricity, okay? I mean, given a potentiometer, um, circuit, that is a reading on the ammeter that is zero. So the LDR is covered, right? LDR, remember the LDR uh, that I get the, the scenario here? That if it's an LDR like that, um, it's going to be if it's bright, so it's dark here, right? And this is bright. If it's very dark, it means that the resistance is very high. So if we cover up an LDR, means that the resistance across here is going to increase, right? But the ammeter is zero. What does it mean to say that the ammeter is zero? It means that there is no current flowing through. The potential difference at that point and the potential difference at that point is basically the same. So if this is our power source, right, this is positive, negative, and electrons are moving in this direction, right? So they are already in the wire and they're forced to move in that direction. It means that these points have the same potential drop. As I lose voltage across this one, 
I also lose that same voltage across that one. That's how potential meters work. So as I reach this point here, the energy that I have lost in overcoming resistance in this wire is the same as the voltage across me overcoming that resistor. So there will be no potential difference. So there will be no potential drop. So basically, for us to have an ammeter reading that returning back to zero so a reading that goes back to zero when the ldr is covered when this resistance increases it means that this is going to get more voltage right so electrons understand that this is having a higher resistance so it needs more electrons more more energy sorry so it gives it more 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 energy but this one has less energy so the voltage drop that's going to go through here actually decreases right meaning that this portion is now needing a small value so we have to move this to the left so that it can compensate for that decrease right so we have to move the contact to the left so that this portion right which is very small <coughs> will be equal to the voltage drop that is occurring across that resistor so that is how potential meters work the ammeter is zero simply because there is no current that is flowing through and if the resistance increases means the other one gets a very small potential drop if it gets a small potential drop we have to move our ammeter to the to the left so that that is compensated very important. Uh, moving on to question 38. What are isotopes? Isotopes are nuclei of the same element with different number of neutrons. It's not um, the same. It's not nucleons. Nucleons involve both neutrons okay, and protons. right? So they have the same protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. So the answer is C. I'm moving on to question 39. So we're given a neutron that is fired at a 235-92 uranium nucleus. So it is absorbed, okay? So we have 1 and 0, this is our nucleus, that is fired at a 235-92 uranium nucleus. It is absorbed and it's forming 141-56 and 92-36 Kr, Ba, right? But we know that nuclear number has to be conserved. But if you look at the right, we have 1 plus 235, that gives us 236. But if we look at here, it's 141 plus 92. That gives us a total of 233. Meaning that I'm three nuclear neutrons missing um, from having the same nuclear number. So it's actually plus 3 of 0 and n. So we need three neutrons so that this becomes equal. So it's 3. Um, the last question of our paper, we're given a pion that's positively charged meson. That is a charge of plus E. Okay, it consists of an up quark and one other quark. What could that quark be? Hmm. So since we're given a charge of E, we know that up quarks have a charge of 2 over 3 E. As you can see from the right, I've given you all the particles that you would need um, for AS fundamental particles. So I need you to know these charges by heart, right? How do I know them? Well, if you look at an up quark, right, the mere fact that it's up, right, up, I just said that that has to be positive, 2 over 3. It means, actually means up, right? If it's bottom, bottom is actually negative 1 over 3, right? It's a bottom down, right? Um, so up usually works with down, okay? So okay. So let, let me make this easy. So up um, and down, quark, that's positive, 2 over 3, and that's negative 1 over 3, right? If we have a top quark, again, it's plus 2 over 3, and the bottom quark, would then be negative 1 over 3. The other one is the charm quark. It would be plus 2 over 3. And the other one would be the strange quark, which would be negative 1 over 3, right? So I usually forgot the strange quark, right? Because it's so difficult to um, know which one between the strange and the charm is negative because down and top is easier, right? If it's down, is negative. Bottom is negative. Top is positive. Up is positive, right? But for challenge strange, they sort of don't obey that same principle. So I, I just said, if I have the word strange, right, it's the only word that has an N that is over here. And that N stands for negative. Right? So it has to be negatively charged. That N stands for negative, and um, a charm quark is positively charged. So very important for you to think of that. So charm is then N, no N. So it's actually plus 2 over 3 E. It's a bottom quark. <coughs> negative 1 over 3 E. An anti-up quark is actually minus 2 over 3. Anti-meta has the negative opposite charge of meta. And an anti-down quark is actually um, having a charge of plus 1 over 3. So if I say, um, so the answer is A. If I say plus 1 over 3, plus an up quark, which is 2 over 3 E, that gives you a total of E. Plus E. Very important. Okay, so we are done with our paper. Um, 
I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I'll be trying to uh, finish the May-June 2023 paper series. I'll be uploading uh, the question paper 1-3 pretty soon. So I really hope that uh, you enjoyed it. And I have attached um, my paper for the May-June 2020, right? So I did a paper on for 2020, um, paper 2. So I would highly encourage that you watch that. As well as watch my uh, May-June 2023 paper, right? So I did the May-June 2023 paper for variant 1. Okay, so it is divided into two parts. I have part one and I have part two. And I'd also highly encourage that you watch my video on Malice's Law. Okay, and, um, I'll see you in the next one.